There once was a story told about two builders. One was a foolish builder who built their house quickly and without solid plans or a firm foundation. So when catastrophe struck, the house was destroyed. The other was a wise builder and built their house strong and able to withstand the storms. So when catastrophe struck, the house remained. This story and more in parables. Good morning, Calvary. How are you? Morning to our podcast listeners. We are excited that you are here. This is a great week. It's VBS week. Woo! I'm excited about VBS week. Are you excited about VBS week? Our morning sessions are full and we are expecting a good crowd at night. We just want to say thank you for all of you who are helping and we want to pray for you. So if you are helping with VBS, that means doing something like recreation to teaching a class to snacks, any part of our thing, it's important. Would you mind uh, standing up and letting us pray for you this morning? So let's just pray for, for these people. God, we are thankful for how many people this takes to make this ministry happen. And God, we are thankful for the, the amount of children that we already have lined up. God, may they hear your name proclaimed clearly. May they have a good time. May they understand who you are clearly and be with those who are teaching to be able to articulate what it means to be a follower of you. God, we are thankful for this time and this place. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you haven't done that um, and you're sitting there going, man, I wish I had a, a way to help do VBS. They are putting up a tent this afternoon at 2 p.m. If you have some muscles and some knowledge, we would love for you to help. You can show up at 2 o'clock, look for Trevor, our te student teaching pastor, who will be here at 2 o'clock to help set that tent up. Well, I am so thankful for VBS because it reminds me of kids' stories. And as we get into the parables, one of the things I love about the parables is the parables are friendly enough and easy enough that a kid can understand, but difficult enough that adults can't master. And I love that idea. So the next six weeks, we're diving through the parables of Luke. So you might, a little spoiler alert, they're all going to be in the book of Luke. If you have your Bibles, turn with us there. And we're, we're doing one today that reminds me of a story a, that we used to hear as a kid. And this, it goes something like this. Don't build your house on the sandy land. Don't build it too near the shore. Well, it might be kind of nice, but you'll have to build it twice because you'll have to build your house once more. You better build your house upon the rock. It's the firm foundation and the solid spot. Oh, the storms, they may come and go, but the peace of God you will know. Anybody ever know that song? That's a few, like three people. Thank you so much. <laughs> and you were welcome for not singing it. You're welcome. I love these ideas because I love this story and I love what it talks about. But I got to tell you something. This passage has been a challenge and it is exciting and I, I want you to brace yourself because we're going to dive in deep. Let's look in Luke chapter 6, verses 46 through 49. Here's what it says. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my words, and acts on them. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood came, the rivers crushed against that house and couldn't shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears and does not act is like a man who built a house on the ground with the foundation. The river crashed against it and immediately it collapsed and the destruction of that house was great. Really clear, really simple understanding. There is two choices in our life. We either build our foundation on the rock of Jesus, spoiler alert, once again, that's, that's what it's about. It's building our house on Jesus or we build it on false sand. Now, in the, the, the uh, ground of which the story was taking place over in Israel in that kind of area, the ground is, is largely sandy. So you have to really dig down deep to find the rock or you have to be very fortunate to have a piece with land. And so they would have understood this very clearly. You either build it or you have to do a lot of work to dig down to the core, to the foundation, to the bedrock to find the good foundation to build. The lazy man just builds a house any old way he wants to. But the man who, or woman who seeks after God, they do the work, effort, and challenge to get to the place where they need to be to have their foundation on Christ. Now, at first glance, this story is about holiness. I do think it's about holiness. It, it's about building our house, doing our work, doing our effort to build up ourselves, to walk and be like 
Christ. Here's the problem. Verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? Has anybody ever been there? Yes. You come to the place where you're going to live your life for Jesus. You're going to try to say, okay, I want to be this. I want to do this. I want to be a follower of Christ. I want to live my life in such a way that my life is a reflection of him only to fall down. Yesterday, we went to Cheesecake Factory to celebrate my oldest son's birthday. And I love Cheesecake Factory, but I made a rookie mistake. I looked at the nutritional values before I went. And as I looked at the nutritional values before I went, I realized that two of the three things that I love to order were two of the three highest calorie menu item things on the menu. And then I looked at cheesecake and I thought to myself, okay, self, if you're going to get a meal and a piece of cheesecake, then my calories, if I'd have gotten exactly what I wanted to get, my calorie intake for that one meal would have exceeded 3,000 calories. Bring on the butter. You know what I'm saying? And I thought to myself, I right, self, you know, I don't think I should do this. I should be wise. And this, there's always a time to splurge, but I, did, I find excuses to splurge all the time. So I was like, I'm not going to do this today. And so I went there and I ordered the third thing that I really liked to order there that was less calories. And I didn't even order dessert. I thought to myself that the kids are going to order some desserts and they don't ever quite finish it, although that was fooled when one of mine ordered something I don't like. And so, but the other one did and he ordered it. And there was about three bites that I could eat and I enjoyed it. And I left feeling not overly full, satisfied, still have eaten a lot of calories, probably more than I should have, but I felt accomplished because I'd made a good choice. And then I went home and I ate five sugar cookies. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I mean, have you ever been there like, man, I am, I am doing so good in my walk with God. I am doing so, well, boo, right on your face. And what we really understand is the sugar cookie analogy is really just a childlike version of really what was going on in our life. So often we do this. We, we have this understanding of, man, I'm all in. I'm not going to be that guy that the Lord looks at to me and says, Lord, Lord, why do you say the things? Why do you say, call me Lord and don't do the things I say? I'm going to be the one he looks at and goes, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And then we fall on our face. You see, the reality is if you've been around the church for a while, you know what you're supposed to do. You know what you're supposed to do because other people will tell you what you're supposed to do before you're supposed to, you know what I'm saying? And we, we struggle with this idea, this understanding and this perception of what it means to be holy and how we build our house and, and dig deep into a foundation so that our life is a reflection of what God wants us to be. I think there's something else going on here. Why did Jesus share this parable at just this time? This is the point where I'm going to pause and, and, and say to you, I'm going to cover some stuff and it's not going to look like this stuff is going together and you're going to be sitting there going, Daniel, where are you going? Daniel, where are you going? Until the end when it comes back together. I always like to tell you when I do that. So you're not in the middle going, ah, this is, okay, so stay with me here. But we're going to look back and look at this entire sermon as it's presented in Luke and see how it all builds up to this one parable. Luke chapter 6, verse 20. Luke chapter 6, verse 20. This is Jesus' first Message, his first sermon to his followers of Jesus. Encouraging words, right? You're expecting a great sermon. And here's what he says. Then looking up at his disciples, which by the way meant he was sitting down. And when a teacher was sitting down, that meant take notes. This is important, okay? So he is looking up at his disciples and he said, You who are poor are blessed because the kingdom of God is yours. You who are now hungry are blessed because you will be filled. You who now weep are blessed because you will laugh. Great first words, right? You are blessed when people hate you, when they exclude you, insult you, and slander your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Take note, for your reward is great in heaven, for this is the way their ancestors used to treat the prophets. Cheery first message. You should be hungry. You should not get angry. So sorry, those of you who know what hangry is, you can't, you can't do that. You know what, anybody know what hangry is? It's a place where you're so hungry you become angry. It's most common found, never mind. Um, 
it's not good. But it's a, so this idea of being hangry is bad, but when you hunger for God, it's good. And it says, happy are you when your life is a wreck. Happy are you when everything seems to be falling apart is basically how I read that. Rejoice in those moments for you are following God. Who wants to sign up to follow God? Well, he goes on. He goes on and, and basically in verses 24, he, he not only says, happy are you when you don't have, but he says, woe to you who think your life is together. Woe to you who are rich. Woe to you who are not in want. And this is a place where we ought to pause and go, uh-oh. Because most of us in this room are going to have lunch. Most of us in this room are not in want. Now, we may want like a nice new car. We may want a bigger house. We may want a better paying job. We may want the white picket fence, but you don't need those things. And he says, woe to you who aren't in want. And when it describes want there, it means that you actually have needs that aren't being met. Woe to you. And your nice seated padded, cushioned chairs in your air-conditioned church. Whoa. How does this begin to fit together? And where is he going with this as he delivers this message? And then he goes on in verses 27 and 28 and says this, But I say to you who listen, because some have probably checked out, right? Love your enemies. Do what is good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who mistreat you. Love your enemies. Basically, let them attack you is kind of how it feels. It, it, you want, this is the point where you kind of go, Jesus, you're kind of being cruel. And I have to be hungry. I have to be in want. And now in the time when I am in hunger and in want, you want me to be, okay, attack me. I feel fine with this. Go ahead. I, you know, here's the other cheek. Slap away. You know, it almost feels like we're a, a, a pincushion or a pinata. Just keep beating me, Jesus. What are you, why do I want to follow this God? What's the point? And he keeps going. Verse 41. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye? But don't notice the log in your own eye. This is right after he's talked about there are blind people leading the blind people, those who think they're following religious leaders. You be careful because it's a blind person leading a blind and you don't really follow religious people. You should follow Jesus is what he's going to. And he says, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye but don't notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out that is in your eye when you yourself don't see the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck in your brother's eye. So now I have to be hungry. I have to be poor. I have to be in want. I have to be nice to those who are meeting me, and I have to take a speck out of my own eye because it's being blocked with logs, and I can't look at other people and judge them. I like judging people. Do you like judging people? No one wants to shake that. <laughs> There's no like... Don't move an inch. <laughs> you know how we often judge our peop other people? We judge other people, and, and, and not, it didn't start mean. It's, it's, it's in a way that makes ourselves feel better. It's, oh, I'm, I'm bad, but whew, did you see that person? I'm not doing great following you, God, but whoa, I'm better than that person. And, and so then we gather together with our, our friends and we start going, yeah, well, we should feel good because we're, and so churches build their culture sometimes in this. And he says, stop, you can't judge. Don't judge. Don't use Facebook or social media to lambast every single person in your world. Don't attack others. Why do you judge others when your own life is full of mess? And he goes on in verse 43 and he says, A good tree doesn't produce bad fruit. On the other hand, a bad tree doesn't produce good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. This is building up. This is building up to the place where he gets to the parable. Figs aren't gathered from thorn bushes or grapes picked from a bramble bush. A good man produces good out of the good storeroom at his heart. An evil man produces evil out of the storeroom for his mouth speaks from the overflow of his heart. Basically, if you are living a life that is in shambles, if you are the one who's sitting here talking bad about other people, he's looking at you and he's going, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Because if you are walking with me, there will be evidence, there will be 
fruit. There will be something in your life that people can look at and they go, that is a follower of God. And because we know that, here's what happens. Our identity rests in what we think is holiness, but what we ultimately do so quickly without even realizing we're getting there in such a slippery slope that it just happens like that is we wake up one moment and we sit there and we go, I don't want to be the guy who says Jesus is looking at and going, why do you call me Lord and don't do what I say? So I put on this mask and I pretend to be holy. And the only way we know to be holy is to judge other people. Because our efforts seem to struggle. So here's the result. When we try to be something, when we try to be set apart, we try to be like God, but we know we can't. We end up fake being happy and full of God. This works for a while, but ultimately, no, we can't arrive here. So this results in us being something we are not. A person that acts like they are not in want, a person that acts like they are rich and their life is together, this brings about enemies. After all, who are you? You're a bunch of hypocrites. We all know we struggle. We think we have our life together. Instead of loving those that have attacked us, we condemn them and we judge their fall short life. We judge, we judge because we know we aren't worthy. Deep down in the core of who we are, we aren't living as holy as we pretend. So we pick subjects that we don't struggle with and we lambast on social media and with it decrying how it is the fall of humanity. Instead of forgiving others, we judge all the while ignoring the speck in our own eyes. We follow others who have similar belief, which results in the blind leading the blind, producing results of disciples who aren't really following Christ, but ourselves. And becomes, we become people who come up with a set of rules, all the while thinking that it is these rules that are holy. We surround our kids with holy kids, hoping the world won't rub off on them. We try to build holy churches where the problems of the world don't come to our stained glass view. We fill our minds with the ideas of we aren't that bad, at least we're better than them, yet we are deeply broken, deeply in need, and we don't know why, because after all, aren't we supposed to be followers of Jesus? Has anybody been there? Oh, we're way past sugar cookies here. And the reality is most of us in this room think, I am so broken, and these people in this room there may be one or two other broken people, but man, they are followers of God. And it's so easy to come into a place like this and to feel like I have to be a fake and I have to put on these pretenses and I have to be something I'm not because I need to feel like I'm not the worst part of humanity. I'm not the downbringing of the Christian faith and that I am not failing as miserably as I feel like I'm failing in the core of my heart. You are not alone. You're not. And see, the reality is, the reason we struggle with this is because we don't really understand what holiness is really all about. I'm gonna say two sentences now, and if you miss the, if you hear the first and miss the second, you're gonna think I'm a heretic, so Listen to both, okay? But if you get anything in this message, get this. Holiness isn't really about trying to be like Jesus. Let me say that again. Holiness isn't really about trying to be like Jesus. Holiness is about finding Jesus. Because you see, when you find Jesus, you realize, oh, I need you. And your brokenness and your problems, when you find Jesus, he looks down into the core of your being and he sees your wants and he sees your struggles and he sees your brokenness and he sees your addictions and he sees your sins and your mistakes and he sees the turmoils in your life and he looks into the core of who you are and he says, I love you right there. And when Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and then do not do what I say, it's because you haven't found him. 
It's because you've tried to fool Jesus, and you can't fool Jesus because ultimately if you find Jesus, you will want to know him. And as you get to know him more, as you abide with him, as you dwell with him, your character, your being changes. And there is a freedom that comes off your shoulder that says, I don't ever have to be to be accepted. I am accepted by the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the one who made me just as I am right where I sit. Can you let the love of Jesus fall on you today? Now hear me, I, I'm not saying that you can go, oh good, Jesus loves me, gonna live like I want to. Because that's the sure sign you haven't found Jesus. But when you abide, when you live, when you dwell with Jesus, holiness happens. You see, holiness, well, look in Luke chapter 6, verse 48. The wise man is like a man who builds a house, who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood came, the rivers crashed against that house and couldn't shake it well because it was well built. It's the well built that distracts us, right? Because well-built requires action. Well-built requires works. If something is going to be built well, then you have to actually do something. And we sit there and go, okay, what am I supposed to do? Well, look back at the beginning of that verse. It says, he dug deep. So here's the question. Where do you dig? Most of us dig at each other. Most of us dig at superficial things. Pretend holiness and and fake life. Most of us dig at this idea of, and, and we can even go to the other side. We can, we can know that we can't be so holy that we actually create a holiness of, of being not holy. Does that make sense? The place where we say, my life's a mess. Everybody's life's a mess. Let's glory in our life being a mess. That's not glorifying to God either. And so we struggle with this idea of, of how to dig deep, but really the only way to dig deep is to dig deep into the soul of what you were made to be, a child of God. You dig deep into the holiness of God because you see holiness ultimately results in us finding the Holy One in us. As you allow Christ to come in your life, as you give him control of your life, the Holy One, Jesus, God himself, dwells with you. And as he dwells with you, you will change. You will become more like him. Holiness is recognizing that the Holy One lives in you. So Daniel, what... What do I do there? Well, this results in us hungering for God. If you really look at this passage, listen to how it plays out. Going back to how we hunger, we hunger because we have hunger pains caused by our own mistakes. We are to love our enemies because we often have been our own worst enemy. We are to forgive because we are still in need of forgiveness. We are not to judge because we have not, nor will we ever fully arrive. Fruit comes here when we realize that it is in our brokenness we allow God to dwell in us. You see, it's all building towards this. Will you let the Holy One come in you and live? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Because you don't know me. Will you know him? Will you allow him to come into your life? And I mean really come. In your pain and in your addictions and in your brokenness and in your suffering and in your history, would you allow God's love to pour down into your life, to look into your life and change you? Not so that you can go back and live that way, but so that you can understand God's love is for you. Brennan Manning has this quote, the theologian. He says, I am convinced that at the end of our life, the Father will ask us one question. 
And this question simply is, do you believe that my son loves you? The ramifications of that are enormous. Because so often we don't really believe Jesus loves us because we try to earn his love. We feel like I have to be this, I have to do this, and I have to, and and what we want is for him to look at us and say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. But is it possible that the only way that he will actually say, well done, thy good and faithful servant is when we understand God loves us, that Jesus loves us. And to the true follower of Christ, he understands, she understands, I will never arrive and I will never be holy as I want to be, but the Holy One lives in me and I will let his love pour down into my heart and into my soul and I will pick myself up and I will journey in this abiding relationship through the good and the bad and whatever comes my way tomorrow, whatever comes my way the next day, I will rise up because the storms of life will not hold me back. The storms, you see, are the key, whether or not you understand you're walking in holiness. The storms, the sins, the mistakes, the brokenness of this world, when the storms arrive, where is your foundation? Because those storms, the storms are caused by our brokenness. Oh, it may not be your brokenness, but it's caused by someone. I'm convinced that if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned in the garden, we wouldn't have natural disasters. If Adam and Eve hadn't sinned in the garden, we wouldn't have things like cancer. If Adam and Eve hadn't sinned in the garden and we don't sin, then we don't have things like worry and lust and anguish and theft and murder and all these horrible things that go on in our life. If, if we don't sin, then the storms of life don't happen. Everything's a sunny day. But through the course of humanity, in our brokenness, in our falling away from God, we are desperate in need to find him. So will you let the Holy One dwell in you to know Him, to dig down deep and and in those moments when right after you've made a colossal mistake, will you allow His love to cover you? He's still there. And then will you strive to be like Him, more like Him, and to let Him come into your life? Jesus knew he would struggle with this. So as he was about to go away, he took what was around him, some bread and some wine. We use juice here. And as he took the bread, he broke it and he said, whenever you are struggling, whenever you are making this life about you, I want you to remember that my body was broken for you. And so often what we do is we take the bread and we we break it off as a representation of Christ's body and we remind ourselves of the sacrifice he does for us. But I want to take it to even one other level this morning. You see, his body was broken because of your sin. And in the Old Testament, the body of an innocent lamb was broken and the blood was spilled so that something innocent could pay for the wrongs and the mistakes of us. And so it's not a um, misrepresentation to say that his body was broken for us. And so when you take the bread off today, I want you to think of what is that area of your life that is broken? Are you suffering with an addiction? Let this represent that. You see, in our struggles, in our sin and whatever areas we're struggling with in our life, we have this problem. We are broken people. Yet when we take the cup, it represents his blood and it is the blood of Jesus that covers our brokenness. It is the blood of Jesus that goes into the very pore of every fiber of our brokenness and is sponged up and covers it and changes it and makes it new. And as we consume the things of Christ, as we consume his grace and his love, we realize here's where holiness is found. So today, 
as we take the bread, I want you to do something a little unusual. Yes, it represents God's, Jesus' body that was broken for you on the cross. But today, as you tear off that bread, maybe before you even get there, I want to give you just a moment to think, what is that thing, that area in your life that's making you believe that Jesus doesn't love you? What is that area, that lie, that you need Jesus to come down for and love you anyways? And here we dip it in the juice. And as you dip that in the juice, I want you to, to symbolize Christ's blood that was came that came to cover that brokenness so that you would know he loves you right now. Hear me. We are not called to go and live however we want to live. But when we find the love of Jesus, we will pursue him and change. When you fail and fall, remind yourself it's as common as a meal to remind yourself of Jesus' love covering you. So as our deacons come forward today, as we are about to take the bread, and the way we do it here is we ask you to come up these two side aisles, and then you go back to the middle or the outside back. As you do this today, I want you to simply take off a piece of bread and break it. And as you dip it in the juice, be reminded of what God has done for you. There'll be a gluten-free station in the back. And let Jesus' love pour over you today. Father, we are thankful for this group. And we are thankful for how you love us unconditionally. And God, we are so unworthy, yet you love us. So thank you, God, for what you've done for us. Thank you, God, for your blessings. Thank you, God, for how you reached down through the course of our darkness and gave us life and gave us hope. Holy Spirit, may we recognize and dwell in your love even now. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen.